So this is an overview of the ITTOs for Chapter 6 in the PMBOK Guide, Project Schedule Management. Before I get started, let me mention that if you're interested, we have lots of free PMP prep materials at projectprep.org. We've got cheat sheets, full-length practice tests, note cards, lots of stuff that should be pretty helpful. So there are six processes, five are in planning, and one's in monitoring and controlling. So with planned schedule management, we're documenting how the schedule is going to be developed and controlled. So perhaps what estimation techniques we're going to use and so on. And then we're going to define activities, identifying steps required to produce project deliverables. So we take our WPS that has our work packages in it, and we break that down even further and identify steps required to produce those pieces of work, those work packages. So we go from work packages down to activities. Then we have to sequence activities. We identify relationships or the order among them. And then we estimate how long those activities are going to take, the durations of them. Then we develop the schedule, and then we control it over time. So look at plan schedule management. It's again, documenting how the schedule will be developed and controlled. Here are the inputs, tools, and outputs. So oftentimes in these plan blank processes, you have the project management plan coming in and the individual plan going out. So in this case, the schedule management plan is coming out. You've also got the uh, um, project charter that may have some schedule milestones in it. That's why it's going to be important here. And then you're going to have enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets, which is, which is very common. Your tools are going to be expert judgment, data analysis, and meetings. You might get expert advice about how the schedule ought to be prepared and what things ought to be considered. And then you can meet to, to plan all these things out. Now, um, let's just talk for a minute about the schedule management plan. It's going to include the scheduling method, the scheduling tools, the format of the schedule, and how you're going to control it over time. Schedule management plan. OK, so now let's talk about defining activities. This is identifying steps required to produce project deliverables. Here are the ITTOs. You've got the project management plan coming in, and that's including the schedule management plan. That's because that's part of the project management plan. And that's going to tell you how you're going to define activities. You've also got your enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets. Then you've got, as tools, expert judgment, decomposition, and rolling wave planning. So let's talk for a minute about decomposition and rolling wave planning. So decomposition is just breaking down work, decomposing it. So in the previous chapter in scope management, we talked about creating a WBS. And at the, the lowest level of, of the WBS is a work package. And I like to think of those as nouns, like if we're building a house, a roof, the walls, the foundation. And then what we're going to do is break them down into activities, which I like to think of them as starting with a verb. So in the example of our roof work package, the activities might be hire a roofer, buy the materials, install the roost, test it for leaks, and so on. We break those down or decompose those work packages into activities. And the idea of rolling wave planning is that near-term work is planned in detail and future work is planned in less detail. So we may not have really detailed activities for uh, the work that's farthest out. And that's okay. We know more about those things that are going to start sooner rather than later. Now, as outputs of defined activities, we're going to get the activity list, activity attributes, and a milestone list. So let's talk about each of those. And we've also got change requests and PMP updates that we could see. So the activity list is just a list of the scheduled activities. If we're defining activities, we're obviously going to get a list of them. And then activity attributes. These accompany the activity list and include things like activity codes, predecessors, successors, leads and lags, and so on. And then the milestone list. This is a list of project milestones, which and it indicates whether the milestone is mandatory or optional. So these are the three key outputs as we define our activities. Now let's move on to sequencing activities. This is identifying relationships or order among project activities. Okay, so as a reminder, we've already decomposed and defined our activities. Now we're gonna just have to sequence them and put them in the right order. So that's what this is all about. So here are the inputs, tools, and techniques, and outputs of the sequence activities process. We've got our project management plan coming in. It's gonna tell us how to do it. It's got the 
schedule management plan inside of it. And then we've got a list of project documents. And if you'll notice, those are really, most of them, are outputs of our previous process, define activities. Our activity attributes, our activity list, and a milestone list. We've got to know what activities we have, or we've defined, so we know what to sequence, basically. And you've got your enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets as inputs, too. Let's talk about some of the tools. Uh, the precedence diagramming method, dependency determination, and leads and lags. So PDN, the precedence diagramming method, documents four types of relationships. Finish to start, finish to finish, start to start, and start to finish. That's what we're talking about when we say the precedence diagramming method. So here's just kind of a, a list of what those might look like on a on a network diagram. And then there's four uh, other types of dependencies. There's mandatory dependencies, which are legally required or inherent in the nature of the work. Discretionary are based on knowledge of best practices, so they're a good idea. And there's external dependencies, things that are outside of the control of the project team, and internal are inside their control. So oftentimes a, a dependency can be one of the first two, and then one of the last two. It doesn't have to be just one in this uh, of these four. It can be more than one. And then a lead and lag. A lead is the amount of time that a successor can be advanced or that it can start early. And a lag is the amount of time a successor would be delayed. So here's an example. A lag might be uh, once we finish writing, we wait 15 days, and then we can begin editing a document. So it's a finish to start relationship, but it adds in a lag. We've got to wait to start the next activity. And then a lead, remember that's advancing or starting early in activity. So for example, if we have a finish to start relationship between write and edit, it might be 15 days before we finish writing, we can begin editing. We can start 15 days earlier than normal. It's leading into it. Okay, so those are some of the tools. Now let's look at really the key output here, the project schedule network diagram. And just as a note, there's also project document updates that could be outputs. And so it's that activity list, the activity attributes, and the milestone list, as well as an assumption log. Those could be updated as well as we go throughout this. Uh, so a project schedule network diagram, though, is an output of this process, and it's a graphical representation among activities. And it's produced manually or using automated project management software. And it's a, a summary narrative, and actually a, a summary narrative should accompany the diagram. Here's an example of what that diagram might look like. It just shows you the order of what activities are supposed to go in. It doesn't yet have durations. That's what we're going to do next. Okay, so let's look at the estimate activity durations process. We're approximating the number of work periods needed to complete the activities that we've defined and sequenced. So here are the list of inputs, tools, and outputs. So there's a lot of inputs. Don't be too overwhelmed here. Um, the first is the project management plan that's going to include the schedule management plan and the scope baseline portions of it because the schedule management plan is going to tell us how to uh, estimate durations, what method we're going to use perhaps. And then a list of project documents. A lot of these are things you've already created. The activity attributes, activity list, uh, the assumption log, lesson learned register, uh, the milestone list, and so on. All of these things are going to be inputs as you estimate how long the work is going to take. Just think about, kind of in your head, what do I need to estimate the duration of activities? All of these things can be important in helping you do that. Uh, an example with, uh, is the, the risk register. So there are certain activities that could be riskier than others. And so maybe you want to make or estimate those activities to last a little bit longer. And then the other inputs, obviously, are enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets. Okay, now let's look at the uh, tools. Obviously, you're going to need expert judgment, expert advice from those who have done work like this in the past or similar work in the past. They'll give you a, a much better estimates that you might be able to come, with, uh, come up with on your own. But then let's look at these three types of estimating first, analogous, parametric, and three-point estimating. So with analog analogous estimating, we're using historical data from a similar activity or project. With parametric estimating, and actually I, sh I should step back here uh, first. Um, analogous estimating, I think of uh, think of the word analogy. It's making a comparison between two things. With analogous estimating, we're using historical data, looking at a previous project, making an analogy, 
as we come up with an estimate. We say, you know what, as we've done a project like this before in the past, costs a couple hundred thousand dollars. This is very similar. We can assume it will be about the same. That's analogous estimating. Parametric estimating is a little bit different. Uh, we're using an algorithm to calculate cost or duration based on historical data. The way that I remember this in the, um, the term, there's the word metric. And so it's like using math, using algorithms to calculate cost or duration based on historical data. So we may have a database of costs from previous projects that may help us to come up with a calculation for an estimate of a new one. And then three-point estimating is averaging optimistic, pessimistic, and most likely estimates. Uh, one other thing that, to mention here is that under data analysis, still in the tool section, there's alternatives analysis. You're coming up with different options for doing things and trying to determine how long it might take. And then reserve analysis. So sometimes you want to add some reserve or some extra time to individual activities just in case things go wrong. Uh, you could use decision making. Uh, but really, the, what's key here are the outputs. You're going to have your duration estimates and your basis of estimates. Um, you're going to see the basis of estimates come back in the next chapter, but uh, obviously duration estimates are straightforward. It's just how long things are going to take. But the basis of estimates is how we got to those estimates. So if we said something was going to take two weeks, how did we determine that? What's the basis we used for those estimates? How did we come up with that number? Okay, now let's look at the develop schedule process. Here we're analyzing activity, sequences, and estimates to create the schedule. We're taking all those things that we uh, created previously and coming up with a uh, schedule estimate. Okay, now let's look at the ITTOs. Obviously, you've got to have your project management plan coming in, which is going to include your schedule management plan and your scope baseline. Um, straightforward there. And then your project documents, if you take a look, think about, um, first of all, all of the outputs that you created in the previous schedule management processes. You see a lot of them here. So obviously, if you want to create the schedule, you need to know what your activities are. So that's your activity attributes, your activity list, your milestone list. You've got to know what you need to do. Then you have to know the sequence of activities. And we use the project schedule network diagrams for those. Um, and then you have to know your duration estimates, which we just created. And there's some other things that might be interesting too, like your lessons learned register. Um, maybe you um, had an, on a particular activity, it took longer on a previous project, or you made a mistake and you realized that you should have uh, given a longer estimate for something. Lessons learned register might give you information about that and help you consider that as you create your new schedule. Um, but anyway, again, as you think about all these inputs, I wouldn't get too overwhelmed. Think about, okay, if I'm developing a schedule, what might I need? What would be important to have? Okay, now let's look at tools. Uh, and what I want to do is focus in on the ones in green. Uh, you already know what leads and lags are and data analysis and uh, the project management information system. But let's look at these five in green. These are tools for developing the schedule. So schedule network analysis is identifying early, late, early and late start and finish dates. The critical path method is estimating the minimum project duration, the amount of flexibility. And then um, research, and I should say that the critical path, if you recall, is the longest path of the project. And so if something gets, gets delayed in the critical path, it could delay the entire project. And then there's resource optimization, adjusting activities to ensure resources are appropriately allocated. So this is going to be important as we start developing our schedule. If we realize that we've um, scheduled one person to work on two activities at the same time, we've got to make those adjustments, optimize resourcing to make sure that they're you know, not over allocated, as they say. Then there's schedule compression. You could use that, shortening schedule without reducing scope. Um, maybe you realize you put the schedule together that's taking longer than anticipated and you decide, okay, we could... Uh, maybe add some more money or, or, or more budget to the project to bring in additional resources to shorten the schedule without reducing scope. Then you could, um, if you're on an Agile project, use Agile release planning. So just coming up with a timeline of the release schedule based on the product roadmap and vision. So are you going to um, have sprints every two weeks, every four weeks? It's just something you want to consider as you prepare your Agile release. Okay, now let's take a look at the some of the key outputs here. <clears throat> You're going to have your schedule baseline, your project schedule, 
schedule data and project calendars. Let's focus in on those for just a minute. So the schedule baseline is an approved version of the schedule. And you're going to control changes to it and compare it to actuals. Remember, a baseline, we use it for comparisons. We compare the baseline to what actually happened. We look at the variance between those things. So that's the approved version of the schedule. The project schedule is oftentimes something like a Microsoft project file. It shows your linked activities with dates, durations, milestones, and resources. Uh, then schedule data, the information for describing and controlling the schedule. It's kind of like what a WBS dictionary is for a WBS uh, schedule data. And then project calendars identify working days and shifts. Uh, as you develop a schedule, you're going to determine what days and what hours your team members are going to work. That's going to be important as an output here. Okay, now let's look at control schedule. This is monitoring activities and managing changes to the schedule baseline. So here's the list of inputs, tools, and outputs. So there's quite a few here, but don't get too overwhelmed. Just um, There's obviously patterns here, and there's uh, things that um, you're already familiar with. So the project management plan, it's going to include the schedule management plan and the schedule baseline. So those, those are your, your plan for how you're creating your schedule and then your actual approved version of your schedule because you always want to compare your plan to what actually happened. And then skip project documents for a second. There's work performance data. And remember, your work performance data is what actually happened, um, what your actual start and finish dates are, and you're going to compare those to your plan and your project management plan because we always compare our plans against our actuals. And you can also have organizational process assets in this case. There's other project documents that are going to be important here. Project calendars, your project schedule, uh, schedule data. Those are things that you've just already created in this uh, knowledge area. And then as you control your schedule, you could use varying types of data analysis. Earned value analysis, we've talked about earned value management. Uh, iteration burn down chart, that is a used in agile project management where you're tracking you know, the features that you're implementing. And then you could use performance reviews. You know, these are basically sit-down meetings to determine how things are, um, how things are going, whether you're um, ahead of schedule, behind schedule, what to do to correct issues, things like that. And you could use trend analysis. Are you trending upward or trending downward? Are you, if you're off track, if you're behind schedule, are you getting back on schedule? And then variance analysis, that's again comparing your baseline or your plan to what actually happened. And then what if scenario analysis, trying to determine um, what would happen if some certain scenario comes up. Uh, you could also use the critical path method, the uh, resource optimization, leads and lags, and so on. These are things that we've already talked about. And then your outputs are going to be work performance information. Remember, an input is work performance data. Your output is going to be work performance information. You're turning that into useful information. You've tracked your actual start and finish dates. Then you want to say, okay, are we ahead of schedule or behind schedule? Based on that, what do we do? And you've got schedule forecast. That's determining, you know, kind of looking out in the future, trying to figure out when you might finish or hit certain milestones. You're forecasting when things will get done. Then you've got, as, as common in these monitoring controlling processes, change requests, updates to project, the, the project management plan, and project document updates.